Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's so good to see so many people out tonight. We finally got some beautiful weather here, so it, uh, it, uh, we could have had this talk out on the piazza, actually, but uh, Stephen wouldn't let me do something that radical. So uh, I hope you enjoy this comfortable theater this evening. We got a, a great program for you. I did want to mention a few things coming up that some of you may have seen on some of the slides as they've been cycling through. September 22nd, and we're going to have a conversation with Ed Larson, Pulitzer Prize winner Ed Larson, who was here at the library, if you'll recall, uh, well, not here at Mount Vernon, uh, as one of our six-month fellows in the library, uh, and he finished a book called The Return of George Washington, uh, which is a great book. And he also, the next year, came back and gave the Gayhart Gaines Lectures. Now, those lectures we've published as a small volume called George Washington Nationalist. Uh, and the evening uh, next week is going to be him and I actually talking about the process of uh, writing that little book and a little bit about his, his earlier work as well on the election of 1800 and how he transitioned from somebody who wrote about the Scopes monkey trial to be writing about George Washington. So it, it, uh, it should be a fun evening and it's, it's uh, a, a kind of special night that we squeezed in because the, the book was newly launched. And I hope to see a lot of you all there. Uh, September 27th, we're going to have a debate, I think might be in this theater, uh, debating Hamilton versus Jefferson and what they would have done, and uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, and of course, there's still room left in our Gay Gains lecture series this uh, year. We have uh, Richard Brookheiser is giving two more lectures, and you might say, well, why would I pay money to come to a lecture when you have so many free lectures? And I'd say to you, that's a horrible way to think about it. Uh, <laughs> Very selfish. Not what Washington would have done, by the way. A great philanthropist that he was. You know the Mount Vernon Ladies Association is a non educational institution, and we can't do what we do without the great support of our members and our programs. The other thing I would point out about that uh, lecture series is that uh, it comes with all the cocktails you can drink, of course, once you sign up. Uh, so it, it's just another way to get your carb load in uh, when you prepare for the big run the next day. But anyway, take a look uh, at the website, and those are prorated lectures, you know, per, per lecture. So uh, I would love to see some additional uh, seats filled up there. Uh, and then finally, uh, keep your calendars ready for the George Washington Symposium this year. It's going to kick off on November 4th. And as you know, this has been a long time, long going, long successful symposium. This year, it's on the presidency of George Washington which is something that's actually never been focused on for a symposium. And it is a great uh, election year, so we can see what all the fuss is about, because Washington, as you know, invented that venerable office. Uh, and we can learn all about that. We've got a great lineup of scholars uh, and people coming from all over the world, actually. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that, um, that weekend. But tonight, uh, the star of the night is Mary Sarah Builder, and you guys are really in for a treat because uh, she is a brilliant a legal mind, a brilliant historian. She's, she's the, the, she combines those two things together. And let's talk a little bit about how she got there. Uh, she was, uh, she's a, a daughter of Wisconsin. She got her undergraduate degree at, uh, uh, she's a badger at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I asked her if living in Madison is the reason she wanted to write about Madison. And she said, uh, no, actually. <laughs> OK, so that would have been too easy. Uh, she went on to get a, G a JD at Harvard Law School. I don't know if you heard of it, a small college in New England, uh, which shows that she's brilliant, of course. Uh, and after that, went on to be a clerk uh, at, in the uh, uh, Court of Appeals Fourth Circuit, which is the one in, in our region here. Uh, so we have her to thank for the great law that's been held up in our region. Uh, but uh, the law was not her poll star. She decided to go on and get a PhD in history of all things. And she went back to Harvard uh, another, uh, for, for some reason, of course, one of the great places to do early American history, uh, and wrote a brilliant book uh, there called The Transatlantic Constitution, Colonial Legal Culture and the Empire, which strove to understand how Colonial Americans understood the empire that they lived in uh, and really focused on uh, the great uh, uh, constitutional history of Rhode Island in context. And it's a brilliant book, uh, and, and I like it very much. But I also like the fact that she decided to work 
on James Madison and really rediscovered the importance of the revisions he made to the notes of the Constitution, which are one of the most important sources to understand what happened uh, at that, in that uh, steamy, private, secret a cabal in Philadelphia in 1787, and she's going to give us all the inside dope on that story and much, much more. Uh, this book is won the Bancroft Prize, which is one of the most important uh, academic uh, prizes. It's won the Biography Prize from the Society of Early Americanists, and I'll let her explain why it's a biography of some kind. Uh, and it also, more importantly than all those other minor distinctions, it was one of the finalists for the George Washington Book Prize, the most important prize in early American uh, history. Uh, so please, uh, she's, so she's coming back to Mount Vernon after coming to that prize dinner. Uh, so I hope everybody will give her a big Mount Vernon return welcome uh, for Dr. Builder. Um, let me adjust this so I can, so is that, does that sound okay? There's a terrible feedback for me, so I sound very deep, but as long as I sound good to everybody out there, um, that's great. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, very appreciative to Mount Vernon for the invitation and to um, Director Stephen McLeod and Dr. Douglas Bradburn and the um, Mount Vernon Ladies Association of whom I had the pleasure in the last year to meet a number of their members. Um, now let me figure out, this is not my clicker, so let me get my hands on, let's see here if this is gonna work. Uh, I'd always thought Mount Vernon was lovely. Um, and I just didn't know it. Uh, my family had uh, an alarm clock from 1839, and it sat on top of our piano, and that's it on the left. And as I always practiced, I thought I would like to grow up and live in a house, just like the one on the front panel. And it kept me happy through many long piano practicing sessions, how I was going to grow up and live in that house. Now, I hadn't thought about it in years, and then I was down here for the first time for the Washington Book Awards, and the reception was on the East Lawn, and I called my mom to tell her what she obviously already knew, that the clock on the piano was of Mount Vernon, and I guess it was unlikely I was ever gonna live there. <laughs> now, careful observers may notice that the painting includes the balustrade that Washington's nephew, Bushrod Washington, added, and which was later taken down to restore the house to its 1790s uh, appearance. But the house on the clock looks like what many people in the 19th century thought uh, Mount Vernon looked like. Uh, as Doug said, I did grow up in Madison, Wisconsin, and I do sometimes wonder whether that is what unconsciously led me towards James Madison and the Constitutional Convention. When I was a little girl, I never thought about why Madison was named Madison. Madison was as likely named for Dolly Madison as James. The young lawyer, James Doty, drew up the plans for the city. And he had canoed 4,200 miles through the upper Great Lakes, Mississippi, Fox, and Wisconsin rivers. Along the way, he learned Sioux, Winnebago, and Chippewa. And for years, Doty argued that the proper spelling of Wisconsin was with a K. And you can see that down there, Wisconsin. And in 1836, Doty laid out his plans for Madison. The plan is actually dated July 1st, 1836. Madison had just died, but Doty probably didn't know it. In Doty's plan for Madison, a radial design of streets moves out from the capital, a la Washington, D.C., and the streets are all named after the signers of the Constitution. So growing up with the signers, albeit as street names, has proven useful in studying the Constitution. I know that Patterson, the delegate from New Jersey who tried to protect equal state suffrage, spelled his name with one T. And I know that Jennifer, a little known delegate from Maryland, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer, spelled his name with one N. But there's a much larger problem. The names that are important in Madison bear an odd relationship to the actual convention. Take Mifflin. Mifflin Street, where the Mifflin Street block party in Madison, Wisconsin was held during the Vietnam War in 1969.
Thomas Mifflin was a Pennsylvania delegate who I think never appears once in Madison's notes. But the street itself was enormously important in the world that I grew up in. And Langdon Street and its neighbor Gilman Street loom large among University of Wisconsin students. They are the social area for campus, the party streets. But they were named for Thomas Langdon and Nicholas Gilman of New Hampshire, who arrived months late to the convention, having had to pay their own way. And if you know anything about New Hampshire, that fact is not surprising. And one of the most important streets in Madison, Pinckney Street, was named after one of the two Pinckneys whose central purpose by the end of the convention was to ensure that southern slave interests were protected. So my sense of the names bears relatively little resemblance to the standard story of the convention. And maybe in some deep way, this disjunction helped me think about the framers and the Constitution in new ways. My book explores the distance between Madison's notes and the actual convention of 1787. And I argue that Madison's famous notes don't date in their entirety to the summer of 1787 but that they were revised by Madison as he changed his understanding of the convention, the Constitution, and his own role. Madison's notes are labeled a top treasure by the Library of Congress. And you can see that in the bottom of the slide. And the library has told me I'm never allowed to tell people what number top treasure they are. And so you can see it says top treasure number and then pursuant to the library's request, uh, you'll have to ask them yourself what number um, they are. But they're actually labeled a top treasure, and they're located in the Madison building with its statue to James Madison. And I had the privilege of speaking there recently with David Stewart at a wonderful party to celebrate Madison's 265th birthday. Now, last year was a funny year to publish a major book on Madison and the convention. It was the 228th anniversary of the Constitution. And I realized that if I can keep talking about the book until next year, 2017, I'll finally land on the 230th anniversary. But I actually like speaking on non-anniversaries. They are peculiarly appropriate for a book that argues that the notes as taken in the summer of 1787 were not written for us. They weren't written for posterity. Madison, like the other members of the Philadelphia Convention, did not know they were going to write the Constitution. Now tonight is a particularly wonderful night to be talking about the book. It's the 229th anniversary of September 15th, the day on which the delegates completed their work on the Constitution. In 1787, September 15th was a Saturday. The following Monday, September 17th, 1787, the delegates signed the Constitution. And so tonight, the 15th, the 229th anniversary, is sort of a double non-anniversary. And so it's a particularly nice night to be talking to you. It was actually a fascinating day in the notes. If you read any account of the convention, it will tell you what happened on September 15th. But I'm going to explain tonight that we don't really know what happened. The person who was supposed to keep a record, the secretary, William Jackson, didn't keep one beyond the first two votes. And he subsequently crossed those out. And that you can see on the left. On the tally sheet that Jackson used to track votes, he didn't record any of the actual votes, save for the Constitution unanimously agreed to twice, which may or may not have actually happened. There's a few notes by another delegate, James McHenry, but most of what we believe happened that day came, comes from Madison's lengthy notes. In Madison's notes, September 15th takes up nine pages. But as I'll explain, Madison probably composed this sheet in 1789, not 1787, and the two-year gap matters. Personally, I think Madison would appreciate the fact that I go around talking about my book on non-anniversaries. Madison himself did not cooperate at his death with anniversaries. People may know that Jefferson and Adams died on the same day, July 4th, 1826, just coincidentally 
precisely 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. James Monroe, always quite obedient, followed suit appropriately dying five years later, right, in 1831. And these are the wonderful Gilbert Stuart um, first five president portraits that were done um, for Rhode Island. Washington had caught a cold in 1799 and he wasn't in the picture. Being a very dutiful person himself, had he known he was supposed to die on July 4th, he probably would have done so. In early 1836, Madison's own health failed, and according to Dolly Madison's grandniece, the physicians wanted to, quote, prolong his life so that he too would die on July 4th, 1836, that year the 60th anniversary of the Declaration. But Madison did not participate in a death for posterity. He, quote, refused to take the necessary stimulants, probably opium, and so he died on June 28th, and you can see to the anniversary people how aggravating this must have been. <laughs> he was 85 years old, and only after his death was his famous manuscript on the debates of the Constitutional Convention finally published. Now, before I tell you the story of the book, let me give you some background on Madison and the Convention. In the summer of 1787, a constitution was written. And what do we have left of the convention that wrote it? We have an engrossed constitution, a building, a Chippendale's chair, the Sing Silver Ink Stand that was actually used to sign both the Declaration and the Constitution, and an enormous amount of paper left by the framers. Thomas Jefferson famously said that the Constitutional Convention was an assembly of demigods. Madison's actually converted into a demigod in this is the famous um, Howard Chandler Christie portrait that's in the house because Gilbert Stuart's um, 1805 portrait is used. So Madison looks 54 instead of how old he actually was, which is 36. He looked like a kid. Um, and so he's, he's aged to look more like a demigod uh, for history here. But I think demigods are hard to identify with when we want to understand what happened in the summer of 1787. Um, George Washington seems completely beyond our reach. Few of us were commander-in-chief of the country's army at 43. And I think it's equally hard to imagine oneself as Ben Franklin with his Renaissance interest and talent for one-liners, although the late Steve Jobs obviously did because he chose Walter Isaacson, the Franklin biographer, to write his own biography. Okay, And you can see um, the similarities even in the little uh, covers of the two books. I, Out of respect for Franklin, I render these captions in poor Richard type font. Um, Two of the most famous Americans were not even at the convention. Uh, this is a good trivia fact. Uh, John Adams was in London, and Thomas Jefferson was in Paris. And these are the Mather Brown portraits of both of them. Jefferson um, later came to hate this portrait, and you can kind of see why, right? It's not our image of Jefferson. It's an uh, image that he, he sort of wanted to consign to um, obscurity. But both men had no idea they were missing out on the most important event in their lifetime. And in many respects, I think the mess the two of them made of the country in the 1790s had to do with their own insecurities from having been absent from the biggest party. Other important players are too exciting. Alexander Hamilton, later killed in a duel by a vice president, now a Broadway musical. Or too boring, James Wilson, who's always shown with those little glasses. Uh, or too seemingly tainted by connections to slavery, for example, Charles Pinckney. And so, not surprisingly, people come to James Madison and find in him something of themselves. He was quite short. Here is me sitting at Montpelier with the apparently life-size James Madison. Okay, He was quite short. He only wore black suits. He was unlucky as a young man in romance, and then married late in life the irrepressible Dolly Madison. And I should probably not say this, but she is the only woman shown with considerable cleavage on a US coin. He was the son of a Virginia plantation owner 
who lived until 1801, and during Madison and Madison's father's lifetime, approximately 100 enslaved people lived at Montpelier. At various times in his life, he was for states' rights against the national government and for national rights against state governments, for majority rights against the minority, and for minority rights against the majority. He wrote many of the Federalist Papers, was singularly responsible for the amendments we know as the Bill of Rights, he was a relatively successful two-term president, and in an 1836 eulogy, John Quincy Adams praised him as the father of the Constitution. But it's his note-taking for which he has become most famous. He left the only seemingly complete set of notes of the proceedings of the Convention of 1787. Moreover, he outlived every other delegate. This actually wasn't surprising. His mother lived to be 97. She died in 1829, long after Madison had retired from the presidency and only seven years before Madison's own death. As the other framers died, Madison kept track of their deaths, and he literally kept track of their deaths. He knew who was alive and who wasn't. And when the rest were finally gone, he got to be the final word, what the historian Drew McCoy has nicely termed last of the fathers. Now, over 600 books have been written on the convention. I personally would commend to anyone who wants a good standard history, Jean Fritz's wonderful book for children, Shh, We're Writing the Constitution. It contains everything you need to know ever about the Constitution, accompanied by outstanding pictures. And almost every book and article has relied on this one document, James Madison's Notes of the Convention, because the notes provide the basic narrative. The notes remain the foundational text, and they've been reprinted in many formats since their first publication in 1840. And Supreme Court decisions refer to the conventions and notes. You're not supposed to understand, be able to read the little text at the bottom. Don't worry that your eyes are going. Um, this is particularly true since the 1980s with the originalism school of jurisprudence. And on the top is a wonderful new quote from Chief Justice Roberts, one with which I have a slight difference of opinion with all respect to the Chief Justice. Uh, Madison was the principal drafter of the Constitution, and he knew what he was talking about. And the framers are part of popular culture, at least among New Yorker readers. Uh, they are usually blurred into a singular declaration and constitution signer cartoon iconography. And this is just a few of the many cartoons that you can find in the New Yorkers uh, about the convention. Um, I, I personally love this. Are you sure everyone will know we're being ironic? That's, I don't have to have one-liners because I can just read New Yorker cartoons, so it solves a big problem of not being particularly funny. Um, so my book is a biography of the notes. Madison's notes are the most complete and detailed description of the convention. And the manuscript is 136 and a half sheets of paper, 9 by 15 inches, each folded in half with four pages of writing and some little slips. It amounts to over 500 pages, and the image on the left is of the first, uh, of the first page. Now, they're not the only record. An official record of the convention was kept by Secretary William Jackson, and it included a journal and a series of vote counts, and it was published in 1819 eventually. And various notes also survive from 10 other delegates, but Madison's notes are the only ones that cover every day of the convention, beginning on May 14th and ending on September 17th, 1787. And no other notes depict Madison's convention as Madison's do, as a political drama with compelling characters, lengthy discourses on political theories, crushing disappointments, miraculous successes. The men whom loom large in our story of the convention are the ones who intrigued or frustrated Madison. And so my book is not just a biography of the notes, but also of Madison's view of the convention and of the men who loomed so large in it. 
Now the book is a study of the notes manuscript as a text and also as an artifact, a historical object. An artifact differs from a relic. The autographs of the framers were originally collected as relics in the 19th century. An artifact is a physical object with a particular history of composition. And that history of composition tells us important things about the person and the moment that created it. And it is in this sense that the book is a biography of the notes. The most important thing about the notes is that they are covered in revisions. This fact has actually always been known. Indeed, when the notes were first published in 1840, they were even described by Dolly Madison as revised by Mrs. Madison. And Madison himself left a note on the final manuscript page explaining that he had not made all the revisions. But people have avoided exploring the significance of revisions, and the magnitude has been completely underestimated. Now, when I saw the manuscript for the first time in person in the conservation lab at the Library of Congress in the aptly named Madison Building, the number of revisions and the degree to which they cover the manuscript was a shock. And um, this is not me, this is House members, but it is the conservation uh, lab. One of the most wonderful aspects of this project was getting to see the manuscript in person. And a project like this one cannot be done without the assistance of archivists, librarians, and the support of historical research libraries like the one they have here at Mount Vernon. To further study the revisions, we put Madison's notes on a light table in the conservation division and looked at the watermarks. And there's an image of, uh, that I took of the watermarks. And then, using the incredibly low-tech technology of colored pencils, I created a version of what I thought the notes would look like in 1787. And I always include a little version on the right because um, I did actually use colored, colored pencils to do it. I believe that the revisions do not detract but enhance the manuscript's significance. The story of Madison's composition of the notes emphasizes his inability and that of his fellow delegates to perceive the extraordinary document that the Constitution would become. And so tracing Madison's composition of the notes guides us back to a moment when the substance and fate of the Constitution remained uncertain. That is, the book tries to explain what historians always struggle to explain. What happened in the past when you don't know the future? So let me talk about three assumptions about the notes that the book re-examines. First, although modern historians refer to them as the notes, they've been relied on by scholars as if they were taken by a court reporter or a congressional stenographer. But the notes instead were an example of a legislative diary. In the 18th century, legislative proceedings were closed, much like the Supreme Court proceedings today, or the deliberations. What the public had a right to was the final product, the legislation, and a formal journal of procedural motions. In fact, although the House of Representatives would open its doors in 1789, thereby being quite cutting edge, the Senate actually remained closed until 1795. And so without published accounts of debates, legislators relied on private diaries. And those diaries described political commitments and strategic blenders, blunders. Um, Madison kept a legislative diary in Congress before the convention, and he shared this diary with Thomas Jefferson. Madison also later revised this diary, and the image here shows that he emphasized originally in 1787, April 26th, that he was off to Philadelphia, and then later changed that to be the convention. Now, a second assumption relates to the notes' reliability. They've been used as if they reflect a contemporaneous, complete account. But the notes are what historians call a fair copy of rough notes. In writing the notes, Madison was limited by available technologies. And here I mean the, the quill pen and steel eraser. He didn't know shorthand, and he used rough abbreviations that would have been difficult to sort out later. 
His speed was necessarily limited, and we believe he wrote down, at best, 10% of what was said. Twice a week on Wednesday and Sunday, Madison wrote up his rough notes when he did his correspondence, and it would have required considerable creativity. And the biweekly habit affected composition. The longest notes, the longest speeches, appear usually in Saturday's notes. Not necessarily because they were the most important, but because a Sunday with no convention meetings gave Madison time to decipher his rough notes. When Madison wrote about events in the convention on Monday and Thursday, he knew what the convention had gone on to decide, and those days were always therefore written up with hindsight. And so from the very first day of the notes, Madison was revising. Now, I love talking about the notes with my students because they know from firsthand experience that one cannot take notes of oneself when one is speaking. In law school, where we still call formally on people without them realizing they're about to be called on, when called on, they leave their notes blank, called on today, or they compose that section later, reflecting what they realized afterwards was the right answer. And many of my students reflect on how much more brilliant they sound in their notes than in their friends' versions. So Madison's own speeches are the most troubling in terms of reliability. And in fact, the book suggests that in the years immediately following the convention, Madison likely replaced several of his speeches in order to distance himself from statements that became controversial. And this process of writing the notes resulted in one of the strongest stylistic aspects of the notes. Madison imposed a consistent, detached style on the speakers. And he summarized the point of the speech at the outset. And so consistent is this topic style that the notes can be followed by reading the first sentence of each speech. It's a style I adopted for my book. So you can read my entire book by just reading the first sentence of every paragraph and get through it faster that way. Um, the notes are therefore inherently unreliable. They chronicle discussions always filtered through Madison's brain, and there was therefore always distance between the notes and the convention. And a third assumption relates to the audience. People have read the notes as if they were taken for us, for posterity. But Madison's notes at the convention were likely taken for himself and Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was in Paris, and Madison had promised to take and share the notes of the convention. And so in this regard, the notes belong to accounts of the relationship of Madison and Jefferson as collaborators. So what do the original notes tell us about Madison in the summer of 1787? The original notes for June and July 1787 are fixated on Madison's obsessive desire to create a powerful national government with proportional representation in both houses. More than anything, Madison wanted the states to lose their representation in Congress. And the original notes reveal that Madison opposed completely the Federalist Compromise that embodies our modern Congress, where the House represents population and the Senate the states. The two other large states, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, shared Madison's belief. Now, Virginia would have benefited enormously from bicameral proportional representation. And the notes show small states' anxieties about Virginia possible political power, a concern that they had about a national government dominated by one state rather than a theoretical concern about state sovereignty. And you can see the bottom on that little graph, that bottom line is Virginia. So Virginia is like a lot bigger than everybody else. Madison wanted to end state representation in Congress so badly that he eventually came up with a plan to persuade the three southern states to join with the three large states in a voting coalition. It was a plan that would have again benefited Virginia the most, as it held nearly 300,000 people enslaved, nearly half the enslaved population in the United States. 
In late June and July, Madison repeatedly hinted at a sectional division between northern and southern states over slavery. And Madison proposed that the bicameral Congress reflect this division. One branch, he said, could represent free inhabitants. The other could give representation based on the number of all people, free and enslaved African Americans. But enslaved African Americans, of course, would not vote. And so Madison's plan was to give voting power to states that had legalized slavery. Now, this idea was never formally adopted. But Madison's insistence on a sectional division over slavery and his suggestion repeatedly that the slave states needed to protect their interests in the national government instigated the dynamic that led to the five constitutional provisions in the final constitution that protected slavery and to the three-fifths clause that would give the slave states disproportionate power in the early republic. After leaving the convention, Madison would blame South Carolina and Georgia for this compromise over slavery. And his notes would eventually be cited as proof of an unavoidable compromise over slavery. But Madison was probably initially at least equally at fault. His willingness to embrace slavery in the Constitution reflected his own personal compromise over slavery. He believed slavery to be against the principles of the Revolution, but he could not imagine a multiracial American nation. Madison freed no one at his death. His will left the profits, ironically, from the sale of the notes to the American Colonization Society, a group dedicated to solving the problem of slavery by sending freed African Americans to Africa, specifically Liberia. And there is Madison's um, uh, certificate for the American Colonization Society. The original notes also provide a new understanding of Madison's role that summer. By the first draft of the Constitution on August 6th, Madison had lost most of his key ideas. The states were represented in the Senate. There would be no veto in Congress over state legislation. The executive seemed tied to the states. Madison was upset. He was not put on the first draft committee, but he copied that draft into his notes. He mimicked the printed copy. And you can see that that's in his notes, that's the center image on the slide. And the one on the left is of the first uh, draft. And in writing over the printed copy, Madison gained an intimate familiarity with the structure and substance of the first draft. And now the notes show Madison's new role. He had a talent for working out semantic compromise that sidestepped theoretical disputes. And the notes even give us a glimpse of Madison's later famous contribution with respect to rights. On August 20th, Charles Pinckney proposed adding rights to the Constitution. Madison wrote down Pinckney's 11 suggestions, including habeas corpus, liberty of the press, guarding against quartering of soldiers, forbidding religious tests for office. But Madison did, to, did in his note-taking style, using simple, broad language, far removed from Pinckney's detailed language. In fact, the complicated limits in the Pinckney rights were erased in Madison's version. And Madison consistently expanded the underlying principle. And this approach towards rights in the notes would be the one Madison would later follow when he wrote the amendments for rights. The notes also reveal the complexity of the drafting process. In late August, the convention debated the first draft, and the delegates began to send controversial issues to committees. For the first time, Madison was chosen for the three most important committees, one on slavery, one on postponed matters, and the final draft. But he became sick, something that he was susceptible to under stress. And so Madison stopped writing his rough notes over. There's an unconformity in the notes. That's a word geologists use to describe a missing section of time. 
The notes after August 21st, 1787 don't date from that summer. Madison was too involved in drafting to bother writing up his notes, and it might have been impossible for him to remember which debates happened in committee and which on the convention floor. And thus, at the very moment when the convention decides most of the issues we debate today, certain congressional powers, impeachments, the Electoral College, presidential powers, the grouping and relationships that converted the 23 articles of the first draft into the final seven of our Constitution, the notes are the most unreliable. But this collapse of the notes emphasizes the far more important fact that the delegates simply could not see the Constitution in the way we do as a coherent, synthetic document. Now, two years would pass before Madison finished the final weeks of the notes. And at that point, his rough notes would have been difficult to decipher. And moreover, the convention had begun to acquire a different set of meanings. Madison joined Hamilton to write the Federalist essays. Madison's best essay, in my opinion, Federalist 37, insisted that the Constitution had not been written by an ingenious theorist in his closet or in his imagination. And he cautioned those who looked for, as he put it, artificial structure and regular symmetry. Madison increasingly in the Federalist began to construct rationales for the Constitution and write as if there had been a single intent. In June of 1788, Madison went to the Virginia Ratification Convention where he faced attack for positions he'd held at the convention. Two particular accusations worried him because they threatened his ability to potentially be elected. One involved claims that the framers had wanted a consolidated government that would extinguish the states. The other, that they had favored a kingly government with a quasi-monarchical executive. And Madison began to distance himself from these positions at the convention. And then, as a member of the first Congress under the new Constitution, Madison repeatedly confronted the difficulties of interpreting the Constitution. In 1789, Madison looked at the textual ambiguity already obvious in the Constitution with enormous delight in a floor debate. And in letters afterwards, he wrote, the Constitution does not perfectly correspond with the ideas I had entertained of it at first glance. And then, in June of 1789, Madison proposed amendments to the Constitution. Madison wanted the amendments to be incorporated into the original text. He wanted the amendments to be interwoven. Roger Sherman thought this was a terrible idea. He thought they should be tacked on to the end. Sherman argued that the sacred Constitution was lodged in the archives of Congress, and that changes to it should be placed simply at the end of the document. Congress agreed, and the original 12 amendments were sent out to the state for ratification, intending to be separate from the original 1787 Constitution. With this crucial decision, the text created by the 1787 Convention would forever remain visually and visibly intact. The convention and Madison's notes suddenly retained relevance and took on new interpretive possibilities. With Jefferson expected to return in late fall of 1789, Madison rushes to finish the notes. He secretly acquired the official journal of the convention from George Washington. We don't know how that happened because Washington's diary is oddly missing for the two precise months during which Madison would have borrowed the journal. We don't know how or why Washington decided to lend it or whether Washington either decided to lend it. Madison made a secret copy of the journal 
and he began his copy on August 20th, where his notes had stopped, and only then returned to copy the beginning of the journal, suggesting he was working under time pressure. Madison used the journal to make sense of whatever rough notes he still had. And far more than his original part of the notes, the post-August 21st notes focus on textual alterations and reasons. Now there were undoubtedly changes that are, these are undoubtedly changes that are impossible to know with any precision. But how had his perspective changed over the two years? The book gives a lot of possible uh, situations involving religions, but uh, revisions, but let me just explain um, two uh, right here. One, I speculate in the book about whether Madison spoke the statements against slavery on August 25th that he attributes to himself. No one else at the convention ever recorded Madison speaking against slavery. And his words bear a marked resemblance to those recorded by Luther Martin on August 21st. Was this just coincidence? Or did Madison's remaining rough notes contain his remarks? Or in 1789, did Madison decide to ensure that the notes reflected what he now understood must have been his position in having some objections to slavery at the convention? Madison revised his notes to convert his diary into a record of debates. And in the process, he converted himself into a different Madison. In the original notes, Madison is catty, grumpy, and often annoyed. And slowly, by altering a word here and a phrase there, he became a moderate, dispassionate observer and thoughtful intellectual founder of the Constitution. Jefferson returned from Paris in the fall of 1789, a return made famous, if you've seen Hamilton, by the song, What Did I Miss, coming back from the first act. Madison shared the notes with him, and the notes altered Jefferson's understanding. Jefferson returned to the United States seeing the world through the lens of the French Revolution, supporters of Republican government versus supporters of monarchy. And the notes fueled his obsession that Alexander Hamilton was a secret monarchist. In fact, Jefferson liked the notes so much, he wanted his own copy. And so he had a young man studying with him, John Epps, copy the manuscript and also make another partial duplicate. And in the process, Epps noticed a page missing, and that's the little image down on the bottom right. The missing page was due to Madison's decision to replace select sheets, mostly containing his own speeches. And these pages include some of his most significant speeches. One particular group in June appears to be related to Jefferson's new interest in promoting Republican government, capital R, capital G because one finds this phrase more prevalent on those pages than anywhere else. And another sheet relates to the very unfortunate vote of the Virginia delegation at the convention in favor of an executive with life tenure, that is a president with no term limits, a position that looked after the convention suspiciously like an elected monarch. By 1796, the final sheets of the notes were in place. And in December, Madison announced his retirement from politics. That same month, Jefferson became vice president. Jefferson continued to view the notes in terms of his own political agenda. And he urged Madison to publish them. He wrote, a most anxious desire is expressed that you would publish your debates of the Constitution. And Jefferson believed, as he wrote, the Constitution will then receive a different explanation. He believed Madison's notes would undermine the Adams administration. Madison demurred. He worried that Jefferson had not read the entire notes. And Jefferson probably hadn't. 
and he worried that the notes would not support Jefferson's new interpretation. He said, he wrote, the whole volume ought to be examined with an eye to the use of which part is susceptible. Moreover, Madison worried that other reports might be made out and mustered. Other note takers would not necessarily confirm Madison's version. He said, it was a problem what turn would be given to the impression on the public mind. Nothing in the notes would damage Jefferson's reputation. But for Madison, the expediency of publication weighed rather different, differently. Madison's personal concerns about the notes eventually triumphed, and the notes were never published. Jefferson moved on to a different interpretation of the Constitution, one in which he argued the Constitution was actually a compact among the states, an interpretation made famous in the rejected 1798 and 99 Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. And perhaps with relief, Madison put the notes away. After retiring from the presidency in 1817, Madison continued to revise the notes to increase their appearance of comprehensiveness. He added revisions from the newly published official journal. He inserted missing sections of speeches paraphrased from another set of notes, ones that he criticized as widely inaccurate. And he and his brother-in-law began to prepare a transcript in which the notes would appear among letters that explained the larger context. And although over the years he repeatedly flirted with publication, he refrained. He consistently worried about other accounts. Not until 1827, 1828, did the other three most significant note takers at the convention, Rufus King of Massachusetts, John Lansing of New York, and the Secretary William Jackson die and Madison kept track of those deaths. By 1829, Madison was the only living member left, and he settled on posthumous publication. Madison's will left his notes to Dolly Madison. Publishers failed to offer her a satisfactory amount, and eventually friends in Congress persuaded Congress to buy the papers for $30,000. And in 1840, Madison's notes were finally published in a three-volume collection of his papers. In the introduction, a single description of Madison's writing of the notes reassured readers of their contemporaneous accuracy. And this description's been repeated by countless historians. But Madison never wrote in his entire hand that the notes had been written quite the way we imagined that summer. And you can see the claim made by Dolly Madison in the red italics. Madison wrote, I was enabled to write out my daily notes during the session, or with a few, within a few finishing days after its close. That's actually completely true. And then Dolly added, in the extent and form preserved in my own hand, in my files. Madison may have consented to the addition. His handwriting actually appears on the same piece as a little insertion, but he never wrote it himself. Madison himself had never settled on a precise explanation of the relationship between his notes and the convention. Madison understood his revisions as repeated efforts to create a record, his record of what he saw as significant at the convention. And yet every revision, small and large, increased the distance from the summer of 1787. Over the years and decades, words, concept, compromises shifted focus and took on new political meanings. Motivations were disputed. Context was lost. The convention could not see the Constitution until the final days. And from the moment the Constitution became visible, it was contested. The respect owed the framing generation demands appreciation for the political world 
in which they struggled to stabilize the country. The understandings of the Constitution shifted over the summer of 1787 and continued to transform that fall into 1788, 1789, 1791, 1796, 1799. Over the first decade, the Constitution survived and indeed did begin to become the Constitution. But Madison's narrative in the notes was always that of James Madison, a member. Beginning in 1787 and continuing for half a century afterwards, he struggled to understand what had happened that summer, a struggle that continues into our own day. It's been a great privilege to speak here tonight. Thank you very much. New Yorker cartoon anybody's ever done on a um <laughs> and I think that um, there we're happy to take a few questions I guess I'm not going to call on people but people in the aisles here uh, have microphones and I think if you raise your hand somebody will help you ask your question on a microphone so that people can hear do you know if his will is in the Library of Congress as well? Uh, let's see, where's that? Wave your hand so I know who's talking there. Okay, wait over there. Um, uh, yes, no, his will, we have his will, and um, uh, I think you can actually see his will online and also through uh, a wonderful project by the University of Virginia um, uh, of the Founders Papers. His, um, his, uh, he, tr he trained a little bit as a law student, and, and so he actually liked um, trust and states a lot. It's a class that I teach in my law side. Um, Madison's will came as a great shock to his private secretary on the issue of slavery, and his secretary had moved uh, west to Illinois. And when Madison's will was published in the paper, his secretary actually wrote back to Montpelier to ask people, was it a forgery? Because he was so upset that no one had been um, that no one had been freed, and um, and it was an, it was an enormous upsetness to the people around uh, Madison, but um, but you can see as well. I think it's online, and I can't remember whether it's through the library or through the Founders Project. What was uh, Madison's view? Of Marbury versus Madison, since it's uh, with respect to judicial review, since it's not in the Constitution, it's not discussed in uh, Madison's notes, and uh, I think he was also the Madison in Marbury versus Madison. Yeah, he is the Madison. <laughs> Madison. Yeah, he is in Mar. That and, is the same person. And it didn't become the controversy that it is today because after Marbury versus Madison, there wasn't a law declared unconstitutional for over 50 years. So. What was his thoughts about it? Yeah, so um, this is a topic I actually wrote, I write, write a lot about on judicial review also. Um, M Madison, much to the appointment, disappointment of federal judges, whom I give some talks in front of, wasn't that interested in the judiciary. Um, he wasn't trained as a lawyer and he had no interest in being a judge. So unlike a lot of other uh, framers, Madison didn't think the judiciary was all that interesting, quite frankly. Um, he, his idea for uh, the limit on, on a state law in particular, but also congressional law, was uh, modeled on the British idea of a privy council. And so Madison wanted what we would think of as a veto power in Congress uh, over state laws, and originally a council made up of basically the executive branch and judiciary to review Congress. And he loses both of those. Um, Madison, in his notes, records people who are judges in particular who assume that the very idea of a written constitution will require that the judiciary has the ability to enforce that boundary. And Madison certainly never writes anything in opposition to that. What Madison probably was disappointed with um, over his lifetime was that Madison believed that Congress 
he was part of a number of people who would have believed that Congress should self-police itself more with respect to constitutionality. That is, this is a generation that believes that, that legislators are supposed to think about is what we're doing constitutional and, and then be like, yes, no. And then the judiciary provides an additional check, but instead of like, well, whatever, let the judiciary decide. Um, Marbury versus Madison, um, at the time that that was decided, the part about judicial review was not surprising to anybody. Most people at the time seemed to have assumed uh, that there would have been judicial review. What was surprising and probably upsetting to the Jefferson administration and to Madison was that um, the executive was going to be held to uh, this sort of standard that you couldn't play politics every time you changed administrations. And the great thing about Marbury versus Madison is even more than reaffirming judicial review, it creates the system we take for granted that when the parties switch, the executive branch switches over, you don't get to knock every civil servant out of office and refuse to comply with everything, that there's an enormous part of the government that just continues to go along uh, running. And, and newspaper accounts of Marbury versus Madison emphasize very much this aspect of it, that the executive um, was subordinate to the law. This is probably a little bit beyond your scope of research, but could you talk a little bit about George Mason and Madison's views? And Jefferson, of course, is in the mix as well, because they certainly talked a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, Madison's part of the Virginia delegation, and that delegation uh, includes Edmund Randolph, who he, he's very close to, uh, Washington, uh, and, and Mason, and some other people who Madison's like, how many votes do I need? And the Virginia delegation was one of the um, larger delegations. And at first, at the beginning of the convention, um, Mason and Randolph and Madison are sort of all on the same page. They seem to be on the same page. Randolph drives Madison crazy because Randolph believed that a single executive was a disaster. And he wanted the Roman model of um, three executives. And so there's this very funny part, at least to people like me, where um, they say, how many people is the executive going to be? And Randolph's like three, and everybody's very quiet and polite because he's the good-looking governor of Virginia. And, and there's like a little pause, and then they're all like, okay, one. And then, you know, they go on to be one. Um, but, um, but he was annoyed at, at Randolph throughout the convention. And over the course of the convention, um, Madison and Mason begin to part ways. And in part, they part ways because they're of a different generation, I think. Mason's great fame had been around the time of the Revolution. And, and Mason, in some ways, wanted the Declaration, wanted the Constitution to feel more like a revolutionary document. And Madison's a much younger person and, and really not of the revolutionary generation. And he's comfortable with it not being a revolutionary document. So, um, so Mason's a person who, for example, wants something like the Virginia Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Madison doesn't think it needs to be there. But Mason also, at the very end of the convention, uh, wants them to have a committee to look at sumptuary legislation. That is that Congress ought to have the power to sort of like regulate how much money people spend and clothing and things like that. Something that, again, was akin um, to, uh, to the revolution. So they. They leave in, in, they're on different sides when they leave. Um, they're, Madison's not happy with Mason. They aren't um, happy for, for quite some time. They disagree. And then, particularly when Jefferson comes back, there's an enormous realignment. And around, um, uh, it, around Jefferson's return, Madison and Jefferson actually eventually journey to Gunston Hall to visit Mason to find out what Mason can remember of the convention as a sort of way of talking now about how maybe the convention violated Jefferson's ideas about Republican politics. So they have a complicated relationship. Who, 
who exactly is or who are the sources of the constitutional journal and um, how does the journal compare to Madison's notes and how do Madison's notes compare to the notes of the other attendees of the Constitutional Convention? Yeah, so the official um, journal was kept, kept by um, William Jackson, the, the Virginian, he's, he's aligned with the Virginians. Um, Franklin had wanted his, his grandson and he loses that. And William Jackson becomes the um, keeper of the journal. And Jackson keeps what is considered to be a pretty standard journal, so it's just the procedural parts. It's not any debates, it just tells you um, what procedurally happened. And he keeps a long and almost incoherent set of vote tallies um, with how, how states voted. He does not keep, and it would have been unacceptable for him to keep without a vote, a vote a set of vote counts based on how each individual person voted. And so one of the things that Madison's Notes does for him, Madison, is it allows him to track individual voting by writing down what people feel. So he can keep a sort of running list in his, um, in his mind. And so the journal is completely boring, not to put too fine a pound on it, compared to Madison's Notes. And so historians have really um, ignored it because historians don't like things that are boring. And um, the person who I always feel so bad for when I talk about the journal is John Quincy Adams, before he was president, was Secretary of State. And there was pressure to publish the journal uh, in 1818, 1819. And I mean, this is just when you love the world. Like Quincy has, John Quincy Adams has no people to be like, you figure the journal out. And so John Quincy Adams retreats to his um, estate in Braintree for the summer with all the paper from the convention and spends the summer trying to sort out what happened, and he writes Madison, and Madison sends him some stuff. He's writing everybody. I mean, the Secretary of State's like trying to do it himself, which tells you the size of the federal government was a lot smaller. And, um, and, and he, gets some things, he gets some things really wrong, and he gets some things right. So, um, and then Madison uses that journal again after it's printed to revise his notes. Uh, in terms of the difference between Madison's notes and other notes, the, I think the biggest difference is other people's notes are spontaneous. That is, you can tell they were spontaneous because they're messy and they're hard to understand. And if you read the convention through the, the notes that we have from other people, which are fragmented, the convention feels much more emotional. So one thing that Madison consistently does in his notes is he, is he moderates emotion whereas other people use much stronger words. And you can, you can track that in places where you can tell they're talking about the same speech. Would Justice Scalia's uh, emphasis on originalism have uh, <clears throat> been disputed by your book, then? Um, so, so the relationship between my book and originalism. Um, you know, I don't know because I have really good friends who are originalists who um, remain originalists despite all sorts of things written in all sorts of ways. So I always feel sort of like I don't know how people would deal with this. Um, the book doesn't touch on the ratification conventions, and a lot of originalists would prefer to look into, the, into this very contentious uh, ratification place. I do think the piece of my book that is probably hard for people in terms of how originalists want to look at the Constitution is um, or originalists, one way or the other, tend to believe that the convention could see the Constitution. That is, they knew on the final day, this is the document in the way that we see it. And I just don't believe that. I think they came um, racing around the corner on the last weeks and um, were desperate to get out of there. And we're so glad that five guys, Madison included, sat up probably all night taking 23 articles, scrunching them together into seven, making it look pretty, 
and then allowing them to get out of there before the rest of September was lost, you know, on their farms. So I think the Constitution as we know it is something that happens after the convention. And in some ways, even after ratification, I think it's very much a process of that first 10 years particularly. So I, so sort of, I, have a, I have a sort of different slant on the early period. Um, I had a question about the amount of cross-referencing involved in this, and I just wondered if you first familiarized yourself with everything, or if you would read something and then you go across all these other things. What was your process in cross-referencing? Yeah, so my process was, I guess I should backtrack and be like, I did not want to write this book, and I did not plan to write this book. Um, maybe somebody else would have thought this was a good idea, but I didn't. I had... Um, I have two little daughters, and they were really young at the time, and my first book had taken a lot of research, and I was like, I'm not leaving home ever. And so I thought I would just read the notes and like sit in my office and interpret them like they were David Copperfield. So that was the plan. And uh, I, I actually thought it was a great plan, and I cooked dinner every night, and I was like, you know, this is going to be an awesome plan. And I, in order to do that, I was like, I have to find the sort of version that's closest to what he started with. And as I worked my way through modern, which is to say the 1911 version of the notes, which is the one that everybody uses, um, it, it was obvious there were problems with the manuscript. And so eventually I worked my way back, and the Library of Congress folks eventually decided that I wasn't a complete nut, which is what they thought in the beginning, quite understandably. And, uh, and I got to do all this cool stuff. We went to the conservation lab. We messed around with stuff. I didn't touch anything. Um, but, um, but, we had a good, but we had a good time. So I came to the notes backwards in that sense and, and then walked my way forward. And so what I ended up doing was um, taking a transcript that the government had actually done in the late 19th century when they decided that they couldn't let everyone in to see Madison's notes and compared that with the original and then literally marked it up with every single other edition, including these other ones, and then wrote my way out of that. And the book... Um, th thanks to my wonderful editor at Harvard University Press, um, the book, even though it looks like this, is only 200 and I think 10 pages of text. The rest is the footnote apparatus that you have and a section called evidence for people who like want to know the evidence. But, um, but we were quite committed to the book coming in extremely short. So there's one example only of everything. So I'd have like 10 examples, and I tried to pick consistently the best one. So the book, my mom goes to breakfast, and she reads what she calls her big book, which are those books, you know, people, you guys probably read them, actually. They're those ones that you can't carry around because they're so heavy. And um, I was like, Mom, I'm not writing one of those books. I'm like, I'm going to write one that I can carry in my purse without being so heavy. So, so there were a lot of cross-references, but they aren't here. They're hidden off, off-site. Oh, there's some hand way, I think way in the back, although I'm a little bit blinded. Did Madison's notes shed any light on Washington's role? Because it seemed that he was outwardly pretty quiet, but, uh, but there's also some evidence he kind of pushed his Virginia delegation at least in, in a certain yeah. direction. No, I think the question of Washington, particularly obviously appropriate here, um, you know, Washington's an incredibly important person um, at the convention. And y years ago, when I was a like a junior law professor, I um, worked for Steven Spielberg on the Amistad as a consultant. And one of the things that that taught me was that if you imagine what the thing would look like as a movie, then you realize all sorts of things that you don't understand about the text. And so. One of the things that was interesting in working on the book is um, if you imagined filming it, which no one ever will, the convention, because it would be, you know, only C-SPAN would be like, this is an awesome movie to make, <laughs> you know? And they'd probably have a pretty good audience, okay? But C-SPAN could do it. But no, no, if C-SPAN goes into the making of a movie, they can start here. But, um, 
But if you imagine it as a film, Washington's always there. And in Madison's notes, Washington um, is a enormously invisible but visible presence. And he, he appears in a few places on a few votes. And, Washington, and Madison's very careful to note that Washington had to come in and vote on certain things. So he's there in, in all sorts of ways, um, playing a role, but not, but not present. The plan that the Virginians wanted was the one Washington wanted. Washington totally agreed with Madison in a strong national government. He wanted state power um, reduced. The reason that the Virginians can get their head around voting for an executive on life tenure I mean, no other delegation is like, yes, <laughs> you know, executive on life tenure. Uh, it's because everybody knows Washington's going to be the first executive. And so for the Virginians, an executive with life tenure is a non-problematic situation. And I think a lot of work now on the executive in this period very persuasively suggests that um, it's, it's the fact that most people assume it will be Washington that makes the anxiety over the executive go away. And they've, they've never had a national executive. And I think um, that just the enormous respect that Washington held made people feel comfortable with this new role. Um, but Randolph probably thought, like, there should be three. And he, he actually had a great idea. He wanted three, and he wanted them from the three regions. And when I teach a little seminar on the Constitution, we often talk about like things that the convention rejects, but what would our world look like? And this is one of the ones we love, is like, what would the world look like if we had a tripartite executive where each of the executives you know, represented a different region of the country? So now like California would just get one, and then the others, the rest of the country would be divided up between the other two executives. But, um, but you know, you sort of are like, wow, like the whole world would be different. My students are always like, who, where would they all live in the White House? You know, everybody gets stuck on that question. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that is an interesting, you know, like they're like, it would be like a co-op and, you know, so. I don't know, am I supposed to, I'm like watching, I'm, I'm a big believer in like, on a 15, it's time to go, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs>